it's I'm working on connecting it to Facebook. There we are. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Sandy. I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. We are a couple minutes behind. I have a huge announcement that I'm going to be making very soon here. But without further ado, I would love to introduce you Dr. Dawson. She is one of my preceptors. I love her so much. Um, she's going to be doing a talk on emotional dissonance. And I would like to welcome you to Nurse Talk with Dr. Sandy and Nurses Against Violence Unite. All right, well, I'm happy to be here. Um, I wish the topic were a little more cheerful, but I think it's something that people might use. So um, to talk about emotional dissonance, it sounds so academic, but the definition really is the conflict between experienced emotions, what we really feel, and emotions expressed because we have to feel a certain way. And it gives a disruption in the harmony of our own emotions. It causes us to feel awkward, like we're kind of pretending within your person and at work. So sometimes it's, it, you know, this whole idea of dissonance means things aren't matching up. And um, if we look at cognitive dissonance, that's two sets of beliefs or ways of thinking that are not compatible. So emotional dissonance is two ways of feeling that are not compatible. This happens, um, and when it happens, it kind of threatens our very identity because it's like, I have a right to feel my feelings. That's who I am. And yet here it is in conflict with something right in front of me that's very important. Um, it has a negative uh, effect on our feeling of well being, particularly when our livelihood. Our profession depends on it. Um, it impacts our self-concept and how authentic we feel. Now, I think most of us go into this field because we are authentically caring people. We love our patients and we kind of wanna prove how much we care by how much we do. And so many of us take on more roles, more uh, uh, skills, things like that, so that we can show and demonstrate how very much we care. Um, I'm thinking particularly of a young man who posted on the website on the Nurses Against Violence. I believe he was a veteran. He went into nursing, I think his first name was William, but I don't remember his last name. I believe so, yeah. He had gone in to do COVID care because he cared so much and he was feeling so much like no matter what they put me through, no matter what I have to do, I'm gonna take care of these people so they're not dying. And he was really devoted. You could tell his, his real authentic feelings were genuine and very powerful, moved him in many ways. And yet with the dissonance that he was feeling, he said, but that's not what's going on here. That's not how my boss is and how the organization I'm working for is perceiving this. They're seeing me as a cog, as just a shut up and do your job person. Mm -hmm. And here I am working so hard, putting in extra hours, being exhausted every day. And yet there's, there's no feedback that, that I'm in fact genuine and I'm real. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm being told you're not, you're not enough. Mm -hmm. and it really hits at our self-esteem. And I could tell how demoralized he felt at that moment. And that's what happens to us is we tend to get demoralized and we feel we're, we don't have self-efficacy, that what we're doing, no matter how much we do, is never enough. And some of us come from home life that tells us that. Mm -hmm. Maybe our upbringing or our relationships and as, as we are adults have told us that we're not very good and we don't have self-efficacy. And then we go into a profession to prove that we do and then the profession turns on us and gives us no self-efficacy. And it, it really takes the wind out of people's sails and makes them feel demoralized, not only in their public and uh, professional life, but in their private life as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of, of uh, overwhelmed feelings into mm -hmm. our lives. Um, it makes you not so much physically exhausted as mentally exhausted. Now, I work in the mental health field. 
uh, and I've done it for many years. And there's few times when I'm ever, ever physically exhausted. It doesn't happen very often, but I can be so mentally exhausted. And some of it is from cognitive dissonance. Some of it's just from the fact that it's all mental illness. There's all levels of, of things coming at my brain all the time. But it's easy to get overwhelmed if you can't find a way to connect with other people who feel you and feel your self-efficacy. And I think that's the beauty of this organization is to be able to find those who connect with that feeling of cognitive dissonance and say, look, I'm in this because I am good. I have goodness. I have kindness. I have compassion. I bring all of this to the table. And on top of that, I've been willing to take very rigorous training, not only in my initial nursing, but many times people have gotten oncology certifications or they've gotten psych certifications and they've gotten um, ICU certifications and they've gotten ER certifications. Many, many things that we do over and above all of this rigorous training to prove to ourselves and others that we really have all of those things inside of us and we're capable of doing them well. Absolutely. We demonstrate that. And yet many times the feedback we get is you're not that good. Who do you think you are? And Dime so a dozen. We get that cognitive dissonance and the very worst cognitive dissonance we can get is when it comes from a patient. Because sometimes you almost expect it from management. You almost expect it from the hospital staff and physicians. You almost expect it. When you get it from a patient, this is the person you are there to serve, the person you're giving all of those skills to. And when they haul off and hit you or cuss you out or in any way disrespect you, it, it gives you the worst cognitive dissonance of all because you feel like, what am I doing this for? Who am I doing this for? What is my purpose? And so it can be very um, demoralizing and distracting to us to, to hit up against that. Now, in my field, I'm accustomed to patients acting that way because it's behavioral health and they behave poorly. So sometimes they do give you very negative feedback. I've had people cuss me out and I've, I laugh about this in several languages. <laughs> but many times after that, a person in psychiatric crisis or bad feeling will come back and apologize or they'll come back and I didn't really mean that. Mm -hmm. There are some patients who are simply um, just angry with the world or with their condition or whatever it happens to be and they just take it out on the nurse who happens to be there. Many times physicians are frustrated or physicians want things to go differently and they take it out on the nurse. So that's where the cognitive dissonance comes in. Wait a minute, I don't deserve to be treated like this. This is not who I really am and why I'm here. Um, yes, a paycheck is nice, but if I just wanted to get a paycheck, I could go work in a, a business and make more money than I make here. So that's not why I do this. And so it's very difficult. Um, so social support is absolutely critical. But one thing you can't do is just whine and complain all the time. If you've ever been in an organization or in a just a friend group who sits around the table and has dinner and just gripes the whole time. You never come away feeling fulfilled or that you have grown in any way. You sometimes feel almost more cognitive dissonance. Like I was turning to these people for support and instead I got their problems put on me, which doesn't help mine at all. So it's in, in being very aware of cognitive dissonance, it's very important for us to give those feelings of love and acceptance and concern to each other as much or more as we give them to our patients. For each other, we don't have to, to verify that we're registered, certified, trained, educated people. That's a given with our group. But for us to be able to be there for one another sometimes means, yes, we all are in common. We have all shared common uh, inappropriate cognitive feelings from other people or from other organizations. Um, I can remember as far back as the 80s where on Nurses Day, the administrators would go around and give us lollipops. And to me, that was so insulting. I said, if that's the best you can do to tell me that I'm good, 
is to give me a lollipop. It, it, it would look like a lifesaver. It had a hole in it. And they'd say, you're a lifesaver. And they'd hand you a lollipop. And I said, you know what? I haven't been in preschool for many years. You can take this lollipop and give it to someone who would appreciate it. Because that was, in my mind, cognitive dissonance. You were telling me I'm worth a piece of candy on a stick. And that's, you don't have anything else nice to say to me the rest of the year. It was very cognitive dissonant for me. And so it was very insulting. And I don't think they understood that. I think there were a lot of people that said things like that. And sometimes they tell them to put it where the sun don't shine kind of thing, which wasn't appropriate. But it's understandable when you hit that spot of cognitive dissonance and your whole being of who you are and what you've built yourself up to be is so um, in conflict with what they're telling you you have to be and how they, they perceive you. It's very difficult. So it's a spot that we're in and I, I, I've been doing this for so many years, it's hard for me to imagine it being different. Um, one of the things I have found is kind of a cure for this is job, job autonomy. And so in our field, sometimes the higher you go, the more autonomy you get. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean master's degrees and doctorates, but it can. Um, for example, some people go into education. I was in education for a long time. I got into education administration for a long time, but you're only so autonomous. There are still those people over you dictating a lot of things to you. Um, my daughter is an oncology certified nurse. She doesn't have any higher degrees. She has wound care, um, is pick line, central line and um, oncology certifications. She now does home health and she's very autonomous. She's out there with patients alone. She's done this for many years. She's very good at it. Nobody's, you know, other than her charting, there's nobody really giving her any negative feedback. It's always from the patients. Oh, thank God you're here. I get my chemo, even though I've been locked in with COVID or whatever it might be. And so somehow getting yourself to a place of autonomy in your job can many times help you to feel like now I'm doing what I, I should be doing without somebody handing me a lollipop and giving me that cognitive dissonance, whether it's actual violence or just emotional violence. There's a and lot of that. There's a lot of that. And I think many times, um, <clears throat> I can remember years ago, I had a job that uh, they had a day night opening and an evening opening. So the two, there was another nurse that wanted to work straight evenings because her husband worked evenings and I wanted day nights because I had children. So mm -hmm. we went to the nurse manager and I said, I'll take the day night rotation. She wants the evening rotation. We'll cover a 24 hour shift between us. We'll even take the same days off if it makes it more convenient for you. And she said, okay. And so the next schedule that came out, I was on evenings, she was on day nights. So we went back and said, oh, there must be some mistake. This was the opposite. And she said, no, I'm in charge and you're not. So, you know, that was such cognitive dissonance. Here we thought we were facilitating something really good. We were both telling, you know, working tough hours and all these other things and doing it because we wanted to serve the, the patient population. And we were being told, sit down and shut up. <laughs> so that's why I determined I need a job, more job autonomy. I need to be more able to control my own work environment as much as possible. So any questions? <laughs> so what would you, if we have, so we talk a, a lot also about learned helplessness and you and I have had mm -hmm. many conversations about, you know, like the things that I talk about also on the show. It's, it's, we're at that point where it's nurses are and and uh, you know our support staff are starting to talk more and more and more, and it's great, it's wonderful. What kind of things like learned helplessness? Just so you guys get an idea, if you're just tuning in, um, we got a lot of people that are watching. It's when you have something that you feel very strongly about, like we'll use the uh, the elephant that's attached to a log by a chain when it's a baby and it grows up and it knows it doesn't need to be moving, it needs to stay right there with the log, it can't go anywhere else. So he's learned that he has to stay in that spot 
that can't can't go anywhere else. And even if they take the chain off, that here's my little here's my little prop. That elephant knows it should not be going anywhere, right? It needs to stay right where it's at. So I like to use my analogy of the box, right? I use this all the time. I love this box. I just love the little print. It's really cute, right? But this is the box that we are all put into when we start working for somebody else and we have and we start feeling this way when we really start hating who we're working for, not the job, because we all became nurses and healthcare workers for a reason. So by doing that, it's not a matter of us not wanting to be there. It's about letting the staff have a little bit more ownership in what they do. And that's what nurses do the best. They, they, they have ownership in their jobs. So value that and, and listen to the feedback. And then if they see a little bit of change to what they were kind of talking about, what's gonna end up happening, you're gonna start seeing the morale starting to get higher. People are gonna wanna do more. And then, but when we talk about the box. Yeah. yeah. The turnover rate goes down because people like their jobs again. Yeah. And, and so this is when we feel like that elephant that's attached to the log, this is how we feel. We're in this little box and then here's the little lid and then they stack all the little boxes up. They have us all complacent in one little tiny little area where like some of the, some of the, um, some people out there have signed um, waivers saying that you will not talk about the things that you're seeing. You're talking about the things that, you know, with no PPE, you're talking, you're, you know, like you're not allowed to talk about any of the stuff. You're not allowed to talk about your employer. They're stalking the, the you know, nurses against violence to see what you're going to say. So by all means, I just want to add this, please, by all means, come to me, Dr. Sandy, you can message me. I'll be happy to talk about it anonymously and I will not talk about it right away just that they will know that, you know, so they'll have to stay tuned well. too. And some people really are trapped by geographic areas mm -hmm. and have to live in a certain area because their kids are in school. Yep. There's only one place to work in that area and they're stuck there. And that is really unfortunate because it's hard to get, like if you have an associate degree or a diploma or you just barely are finishing your bachelor's, you are sometimes stuck there. But always keep in mind that, that you're only stuck there for a period of time that there really is a point at which you can say, wait, I now can go a step further. I can do more with what I'm learning in this place and go forward and do something better. And um, I know that I have in my life and I'm getting my 50 year uh, nursing license next year. Wow. I have not been afraid to say, um, this doesn't fit in my emotional framework. And so I'm going to have to move on. So I would not just change jobs for no reason, but I would always feel like if it's providing me growth and mm -hmm. I'm able to learn something new, regardless of whether I think I'm going to use it right now. I went through labor and delivery for a few years and I'm a psych nurse, but I did that because I always wanted to do it. And mm -hmm. um, now I treat people with addiction who are pregnant. So I learned so much in that area. I'm able to use it now, even though at right. the time I thought, this is after a while, this gets so routine. I don't, I'm not enjoying it. And I, yeah. but you go and you, you try to glean from it something that will actually make you better at what you do. And eventually, and it does take some time, you will get that feeling that I'm not out of place here. I'm not being resented. I'm not being treated badly. There is a place for me in nursing. Nursing has, I think it's 42 professions within it. And sometimes you just have to relocate and move around with yep. the professions until you go, ah, oh, okay, here we are. <laughs> yeah, I never thought that I would be a mental health nurse. And it just seems like it's like, I'm like the whisper. I have a question. So for all of our, our folks that are listening, we got a lot of new nurses that also tune in. Um, so is mental health its own specialty? Yes. Is it, or is mental health like pretty much throughout nursing? Like, I mean, if you have somebody that's having some sort of like mental breakdown on a med surge floor, do they need to immediately go over to a mental health floor because they're crying or they, you know? No, I think it depends on how bad it is and how disruptive it is. I've had many, many people in the ICU call me 
and saying, hey, I've got this patient. And they're now seeing snakes climbing on the wall. They're dropping down on their bed and they're scared to death of these snakes. And I'm like, have you all had the lights on all night? Well, yes. Have you know? So obviously we have some ICU psychosis going on here. We can treat that right there. We don't need to move that person. Yeah, okay. We can treat that. Here's some medication you give them until they're out of the ICU, then they won't need it anymore. So, you know, I know what medication to use, and that's the specialty part. Is okay. I can I can specialize in that situation, and I know what to do. And so that's why, um, like APNA, which is the Psychiatric Nurse Association, they have a whole program for ER nurses now. You can go and get some psych training for ER to know when to transfer and when you don't have to. Right. And that sort of thing. So it's very helpful. And a lot depends on what docs you're working with. Because if you've got docs that aren't respectful and don't, you know, don't want you to touch psych with a 10-foot pole, it's very difficult. And sometimes they, honestly, the psych patient just needs you to sit there and listen to them. Yes. They don't necessarily want treatment for it at this moment. And putting them in the hospital makes them mad because they really, they know what's going to happen when they go in and they don't want to do that. And once they get on the psych floor, they get even more scared because there's people walking around talking to themselves. And it's pretty frightening for a lot of people. And they, you know, unless they're having active psychosis, unless they're having some safety issues, it's probably not a good idea for them to go on a psych floor. Um, as far as when I take nursing students out to the floor, um, we have to talk about psych. We have to because one of the biggest things is, is anxiety and adjustment disorder. When they get out there and they go from home and they don't know the fear of the unknown, you know, that used to be a nursing diagnosis. I don't think it is anymore, but fear is. And that's what a lot of people are having right now. And so if you really think about it in the great scheme of things with COVID, fear is everywhere, right? Yeah. And, and also things like sodium imbalances, thyroid mm -hmm. imbalance, thyroid storm, things like that cause mm -hmm. terrible psychiatric symptoms, head injuries, all kinds of things can cause psychiatric symptoms. So they may not be a psych patient and they right. may not need to go to that floor. They need to have these medical things treated. And right. Then, a lot of times those symptoms will dissipate or at least diminish enough to right. reason with that person. Absolutely. You can't, you can't reason with someone who is in a, in a um, uh, you know, low sodium where they're passing out all the time or there's like, you think, well, what's wrong with this person? Well, did you look at their blood values? Did you find out you know, what is happening? Um, a lot of times there's so many different pitfalls as far as their physiological problems affecting their brain. Right. That automatically want to put them in psych and, and over at psych, they're going to go, well, did anybody notice this person's having a thyroid problem? You know, so, you know, it kind of, it kind of comes down to what you were saying. It's not a separate field. It's attached. The, the brain's attached. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, it is a specialty in the psych and, and medical and, and uh, nurse practitioner world. But right. as far as the, other than prescribing, it is attached. And you really do have to look at, is this person combative? Are they suicidal? You know, are they really a threat to themselves or others? Or are they actively psychotic? So, and I know that the actively psychotic people walking around, I mean, <laughs> they're out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I know that you have a huge background in addiction medicine, you know, and you do a lot with addiction. So I wanted to bring up a point and I didn't, I can't remember the statistic because I was kind of rushing on and that's why we have a little bit of a green screen uh, issue um, is that abuse of alcohol and opioids and, you know, and benzos is actually so high. And I was talking about that a long time ago. I'm like, listen, guys. We have to start talking about opioid withdrawal protocols. We have to start talking about see what protocols in cage. We have to because our regular nurses, they might not want to do anything with it or want to do another assessment, but that is a huge piece that they could just, it's easy to spot once you get used to it. So could you give us your, your insight on that, please? Well, um, I was just talking to a, a drug rep today who sells a, a product that's contains buprenorphine, but you're just saying the numbers are going down because the patients are losing um, hope in getting treatment at a hospital. So it's like, it's not that there's numbers of patients not using drugs, they're just afraid to go to the hospital because of the way they're treated at a hospital. 
Oh yeah, most definitely. It's all over NAMI. If if you're not familiar with NAMI, it's um oh gosh, it's the National Inst National, National Alliance of Mental Illness. Mentally Ill. National Alliance uh, mentally Ill. Yeah. Watch. I, I challenge you guys to go watch and uh, look at some of the comments that these guys are making. I've had people when I worked in addiction centers, they'd be crying by the way that they would be treated at the hospital just because this was their last time. This was absolutely their last time. But as far as the, the hospital worker, they're like, yo, here we go again. Here's Mr. Smith. But so we're not, you know, and I'm not preaching guys. I know how it is out there on the floor, med surge, telly, here I am. But when we have these patients that are hurting, they're not doing this to get high and have fun. They're doing this because they're in pain. And whatever has happened that got them addicted, they can't shake it. So they need a little bit more to keep going. And we're not there to cure them until they're ready. They have to be ready and willing. The thing is, if they do get on a protocol that works for them, what's to say that they're going to walk out the door and ever find a doctor that'll keep it up? I mean, that's one of the main things I try to do is maintenance. Mm -hmm. Maintained on safe medications. Right. And that's true of meth and cocaine addicts, and that's true of benzo people. Fentanyl. They need to be on, well, fentanyl. Right now, fentanyl is so mm -hmm. predominant because it's all coming in over the Mexican border. And they're mixing it with everything. Like they're doing an injection, was it methadone, uh, heroin, and fentanyl? And I think there was cocaine. There was like four things when I was working in, tri in triage at the, the jail, they would come in and they couldn't even sit still. Like it's so bad. And doing we have all, they call them. well, I, listen, I don't, I don't get into all of that. I'll, I'll call because it's got eight things in it. You know what I mean? That's what they're doing. And it's so it's like the addiction is so powerful. It totally hijacks the new receptors of the brain. It's so powerful. It's like the bonding between mother and child. If, if you have a child and they hand you the child and you are able to you know, be with the child and keep it, you bond with that child. You would kill for that child. You'd do anything. And so that, that is such a powerful oxytocin emotion. And you don't realize it, it does become a part of who you are and your brain and everything else. And same with fathers who hold their children for the first time. They get completely bonded to that child. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that is the same kind of thing as when someone uses certain drugs, the brain completely becomes hijacked and they completely become addicted to the point where they don't even get pleasure from anything else ever. They can walk away from their own family because they get no pleasure from a good meal or sex or children or anything else. There's nothing that gives them any joy except using because their brain is completely hijacked by the drug. And to understand that is to say how sad it is that this happens to people over pain pills. Mm -hmm. And so of them aren't on fentanyl when they start. They're on pain pills that are prescribed for them. And then they go to heroin because they can't get it anymore because of the strict no heroin in our town anymore. It's all fentanyl. So we have we have folks that are coming through all floors that are addicted, that have mental illness, that have addiction. <laughs> And it is absolutely crucial that we pick up on that because if we can save another nurse from getting injured because they spotted this raising anxiety, this pacing around the unit, this there's something if else is happening. If you're asking that person without <clears throat> judgmental, they'll tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Say, did you just use anything today? Well, eh, you know, they don't want to tell you. They go, no, it's okay. You can tell me. Because you're not going to go, well, tough on you. You're, we're just going to let you lay here and be sick for five days. Or, I mean, you're, you're going to say, oh, wow, we really need to do more for you then. Something. If the person feels that they're being supported and cared for in the midst of their withdrawal. They will tell you the truth. I have people just in this past week who come to my office and say, I know you're going to be pissed off at me. I know you are. I know you are. So what makes you think I'm going to be pissed off at you? Well, because I used again. I relapsed. I go. Well, okay, let's start over then. Okay, mm -hmm. there's no point in me being pissed off about it. I'm upset that you you decided to use when you had other options. What can I do to keep you from that? How can I help you? And they look at me like, oh, you're not pissed? Like, oh, you're actually being kind to me. And that's the thing that they expect to be treated like 
a dirty, nasty addict. We don't what, expect. what I tell, you know, and that you make a great point. You have many. Um, what I say to patients, and this might not work for some people, might work for some people, whichever, guys, the whole point of this is to build that relationship with your patient. You know, Mr. Smith, I just want to, you know, are you, did you have anything, you know, like some drugs or, you know, do you drink or do you, always you know? recreational drugs. Don't say and then that. I, and then, then I say, mental. say, did you use something recreational today? Or recreational? And, and then I say, you know, it just, I just want to be able to give you the best care that you deserve. That's all like, and it is okay. Whatever you tell me, I just would like to make sure that I give you the best care because some things might interact with some of the stuff we're giving you. And I want to make sure we don't have a bad reaction. Same thing. The worst withdrawal and most dangerous is alcohol. And a lot of people, oh, yeah. unless you smell it on real bad, you suspect that that's what it is. Boy, that, that can really, you know, dips, uh, Grand mal seizures. I mean, people get really, really mm -hmm. on that. Where you don't get seizures from the other. Those. Yep. So the the whole the whole thing with the whole emotional dissonance when you have these things that are coming in time after time and it's you know the public doesn't it's not their fault. This is this is the pain that that everybody's going through out there. We cannot we cannot tell them, hey, you just have to be nice. Well, you know, they're not feeling good. We're there for them. They're not there for us, but we need to build that, that boundary of respect. Yeah. And when we have that respect, then this is, and then lay it out. Okay, so Mr. Smith, so in your, which arm do you want us to do the IV in, left or right? Which is, what is, what is best for you? You know, let them have some decision-making and. Well, the other thing is that the last four people they talked to might have treated them like they were a dirty piece of junk. Mm -hmm. People do that. And and they may have been in rehab and in rehab they treated them like that. So if you ever say, well, I think you need to go to rehab, they're like, no, I'm never going back to rehab. Never. Well, it's because they were treated badly at rehab. Mm -hmm. That particular place, there might be a good rehab that doesn't do that. But they're in their mind, once they've had some bad experiences, I mean, let's face it, we all do that. Mm -hmm. you know, if somebody cusses you out somewhere or gives you, you know, like rude service at a restaurant, you don't go back there. So no. that's how they feel sometimes about medical people because they think, oh, they're going to think I'm just a junkie and I, and I don't want to hear it. And you hear that, you hear that a lot. They don't want to tell you. Mm -mm. They think that you might be like those other people were. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, and that's a, definitely a, it all goes hand in hand. So, I mean... If you could leave our audience with any more of your wisdom, some little trinkets that you want to drop, and I had little Stella back here is trying to mess with my stop it. Well, if, um, you, if you I could, just don't want you to give up on being who you are, because you went into nursing with a very powerful emotion and a very powerful motivation to do what you do. So don't let it pull. Don't let these things pull you down. You may need to regroup or relocate or change up some things. Do that. Don't give up on the profession. Say, that niche of the profession didn't work out for me. I was not a night shift person. I struggled to keep awake all night, no matter what I did. I was not a night shift person. So I had to realize to myself that was never going to work for me. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to work days even if I make less money. So you just have to realize that about yourself. Get yourself as much learning from the bad situations as you can and move on because it is there, this is a big wide profession with many, many options. People go into public health, people go into all kinds of different fields, teaching all kinds of things because they have more to give and they can't do it where they are. They need to move somewhere else. And I'm not saying be a gypsy, but it really doesn't hurt if you have to go every couple of years, two, three years, you gotta move on. It's the way it is in this profession until you go, oh, wait, this is where I belong. This is me. And now I'm getting that cognitive um, uh, cord that hits exactly where I am and I'm feeling it now. It's not dissonance anymore. And sometimes it takes a while to do that, but allow yourself that. And I'm, I'm just very picky about supervisors. <laughs> You know, I want to know that that supervisor has as much respect for me as I'm willing to give them. That's important.
And that there's a lot of that missing right now. And I think that once they tap into that, I think it's going to actually, I know it will make a big difference with those that are working on the floor because they just want that respect as well. They want to feel like they belong and they, and they don't feel like they belong. And it's more like a, it's more like a, they have to versus. Right. And you want, you want them to be with you. And some of you may have to become supervisors that you can do it right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Be, be the change. You may have that skill inside of you and you may have to give yourself some opportunity to try it out and see. Mm -hmm. so I just want you all to do your very, very best because it's in you to do it and I can feel it. And I, you know, I know that, that um, these struggles can really feel tough sometimes, but they're worth it. Hang in there, everyone. Take care. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dawson and everybody out there. See you next week. Thank you. Bye.